take a seat. My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Church and just have a couple of announcements to share with you here real quick. Um, the first one being that there's connection cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. Uh, and if you're new here or even if you're not, go ahead and reach into um, that, that seat back pocket right now and grab those connection cards. Fill those out um, and you'll notice there's a couple different sections that you can fill out. Um, one's our, our ministry areas. If you're looking to get involved, if you want to serve in a certain area, um, you want to use whatever gifts, talents that you've been given to uh, serve the local church, to serve God's kingdom, go ahead and fill out what you might be interested in doing. If you're curious to see if we have a certain ministry, you can go ahead and ask questions in that spot there as well, too. Um, and then there's, there's spots as well for uh, prayer, for praise reports, for uh, just kind of letting us know comments, questions, concerns kind of a, an area. If you have anything that you want to ask us about or communicate to us, that's really one of the simplest ways. Um, I find that the, the more that I don't write things down to the less that I write things down is a better way to say that um, and, and send it off to somebody. If I don't like send out that text right away when I think about it, I forget to talk about it later on. So if you have something that pops into your mind while you're here sitting in service and you just want to communicate it to us um, without potentially forgetting, because I know that, again, that happens to me all the time, go ahead and just write it down. You can use that connection card for just about anything communication-wise. Uh, with us. And we just want to be able to, again, if you're new, uh, reach out to you and connect with you um, as easily as possible. So fill that out in its entirety if you are new. Um, a couple of events that we have coming up. Santa for Seniors. You've heard us talk about this here a couple times now. And, and the biggest thing is that the presents are due um, December 15th. Okay, so that's two weekends from today. Uh, so not next week, but the week after. So if you do... Um, or you are participating in the Santa for Senior uh, gift drive, go ahead and grab those. Uh, make sure you return them by December 15th. Um, our end of the year offering special envelopes are available. Um, we're, again, sponsoring or, or, or helping sponsor the Save the Storks mission where they, um, and I'm going to let Trent talk a little bit more in detail about it, but where they buy vehicles for uh, the sole purpose of educating people on um, the options that they have if they're pregnant and, and just kind of being another um, source of, of, of positivity and in, in what can be a difficult time in people's lives and just helping people navigate that in the most Christ-like way possible uh, without being overbearing or anything like that. And it's, it's a great opportunity for ministry and, and for uh, just helping people out. So if you'd like to consider and pray through uh, what your end-of-the-year offering might look like towards that Save the Storks mission. Um, and starting this week, December, can anybody, uh, is it hard to believe that we're already into Christmas now? It's kind of crazy. It feels like it outside. I can, I can start to notice that it's starting to look a lot more like Christmas because of uh, just how much cold, more cold I am and all that good stuff. But man, we're already there. Um, it's fun that we get to kick it off by doing our um, X marks the spot scavenger hunt. And again, that's another thing I'm going to let Trent talk a little bit more about, as I'm sure he will. Um, but we're going to have a clue for you guys each week as we go through this sermon series for some fun gifts. And, uh, man, how's that for, like, vague detail? Yeah? I'm going to let you guys figure out the rest of it because, again, it's kind of a fun deal that you get to do. And our last thing, Christmas Eve, don't forget about this, 5.30 p.m. at the park. Um, first time that we're doing it, hopefully the first of many um, and that we do an amazing job just inviting people to that Christmas Eve service at the Fountain Park. Um, we're going to have different ways of, of transportation to help people get there, help navigate the park too, and all that good stuff. It's going to be an absolute blast. And let's turn this thing into something that communi the, the whole community can really hang its hat on and say, man, we were a part of that. Uh, Christ Church is really uh, doing a great job of, of unifying people within the community over this event. And I think it's going to be an amazing time. But uh, we're so glad that you guys are here. Again, if you do have anything, come see us at the Welcome Center or jot it down on that connection card. Thanks, Jordan. Hey, real quick, pull up that screen of the Be a Santa to a Senior. Can we see that? For those of you who kind of know me, I have a spiritual gift of immaturity. And I just am seeing that Be a Santa to a Senior. So I want you to B-A-S-T-A. You be a basta, would you? That's just me playing around a little bit. But that's actually what they called it when we first heard about it. It's like, you know what? We're not going to call it that. We don't want to call anybody Bastas, you know. So anyway, be a Santa to a senior. Real quick, something serious. Uh, Rick Ponzo and Cheryl are pastors in town. I meet with them and uh, we get together uh, as far as a group of pastors in the community. 
we meet the first Tuesday of every month for breakfast over at Phil's Diner and pray together, laugh together, have a great time. Uh, Rick and Cheryl, the morning after Thanksgiving at 4 a.m. ish, their house caught on fire, and other than the stucco walls, burnt to the ground. We have some people in our church that are just four or five houses down from them. They think it was chimney related. We don't know for sure. But anyway, all of us uh, uh, lead pastors of the community, we kind of just via email said, in each of our churches, could we take a love offering just as a way to encourage them, help them kind of through the process? They obviously have insurance. The town has responded well. I forget which restaurant it was, but one said unlimited meals for Rick and Cheryl until they get back into their uh, home or whatever. And uh, Man, I kind of wish my house had burned down a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's terrible. It's terrible. I guess first responders were able to get in and found his wallet and her purse, which I think would save some major headaches. If I don't know how they did I can't find my own wallet every morning. I don't know how first responders. Anyway, there's going to be some buckets that are passed. And if you could just, we call it on occasion, we'll do this, a dollar or more offering, kind of whatever you have as a way, and we as a group of churches are going to bless them, and we'll do it through the Ministerial Association. So let's do that now. Um, Oh gosh, I should write things down. I had a couple other announcements. Jordan asked me to mention the Save the Storks, not next weekend, but the 15th of December. Uh, we have a young man named Luke coming in who's a representative for the Save the Storks. We're going to take a big offering. The entire, most states in the union of the United States have a stork bus. Arizona does not have one, and that shocks me since Phoenix fits into the fifth largest city in the nation. And so we're going to try to raise a significant amount of money to help purchase. A stork bus costs anywhere between $100,000 and $130,000. And we don't have to raise that all of ourselves. At the end of each year, we do an offering. We raise anywhere from $35,000 up to $150,000. And so I don't know what you're planning or what God has done for you, but 100% of that offering, which will be the last Sunday of this year, um, will take... And 100% of that's going to go towards the purchase. I look forward to you being here, meeting Luke. Uh, we're still trying to decide, is he going to speak or am I going to interview him in a couple weeks from now? But anyway, save the storks. Look them up online if you want. Christian organization really doing an amazing thing. Um, what else, Pavia? Help me remember, darn it. I, can't, I should have wrote this stuff down. Uh, I'll think of it. Oh, we'll, we'll get here. First thing, Garrett, my son, spoke in my absence last week, and I'm telling you, I, Mama Bear, she watched it, uh, we were out traveling, having some fun, and uh, she watched it online, I, was, I came in, she's crying, I'm like, what's the matter with you, I'm so proud of our boy, you know, he really has grown a lot, I contacted Manhattan Christian College, uh, Kevin Ingram's the president there, he happens to be the guy that baptized me when I was a sophomore in high school, he's the president of Manhattan Christian now. And I just told him, I said, you know, there's only so much a mom and, get, and dad can do in our, in our kids' lives and the growth that we've seen in him over the last year and the fact that he spoke on it. He got to pick whatever he wanted to communicate and he spoke on having his identity and all of us having our identity in Christ, not in who we are, what we do, those kind of things. It's in Christ. Uh, that would be one of our biggest prayers that we've had for Garrett. We, we joked with him this week. He's been one of the biggest self-promoters in his whole life about success, and he's been successful. He's a quarterback, and he was, he's always self-promoting. And the fact that he on his own through Christ, through Manhattan Christian, has come to realize his identity is not in any of that. It's in Christ. It really did my heart well. Um, he asked you all to write, uh, use a connection card. And, you know, grade him. And it was fun to read through some of those. I'm upset with three that were written. Let's just talk about them real quick. The first one was, and each one is worse in, in degree. Let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head. Somebody said, um, you didn't stand during the reading of the passage. Don't do that to anybody else. That's a silly tradition that I've done that we take on reverently, but let's not expect it of others. And plus, he didn't start off with the teaching and command of Jesus, by the way. He's preaching out of 1 Peter. The second one was, you're dressing kind of sloppy, you know, and I'm like, well, get over it. Doesn't matter, right? And, and third and the worst of all really upset me. I can't believe somebody would criticize him this way. Somebody said, you don't chase rabbits like your dad does. And I, that's just mean, 
He's been crying all week about that. And so anyway, love you guys. I'm really not picking on it. I'm not sitting here. Even the other comments, they're totally fine. Just be careful. But man, don't be so harsh on him about chasing those rabbits. He doesn't have that gift like I do. And that's just how it goes. All right. We're starting a fun uh, uh, scavenger hunt. And we've been working over the last week. There will be a prize. It's not going to be hidden until the final week. So you can look all you want. You're not going to find it. And it's going to be significant. It's going to be something that you're going to want to fight over. And we're worried about car accidents on the 29th when we announce it and everybody leaves racing to maybe go find this thing. And uh, anyway, here's clue one. Each Sunday when you come to church, there's going to be a clue. And you can't bribe me, you can't bribe, well, I'm, there, everything has a cost, doesn't it? You know, but you can't bribe us. Each week, we'll build on these. Clue number one is when your questions need answers and you don't know the way, you'll find what you need here all out on display. That's all you get for today. Over the next five weeks, we will have another clue just for fun for us to go hit the town and try to find this thing, all right? And so let's get into a message where we're starting a series called X Marks the Spot. You see the X in the manger, right? X marks the spot. Throughout all of Christmas, we're going to talk about this. And I want to start off uh, the theme. We're doing message one of five today titled The Lost Treasure. And it's part one and part two. You're going to see a series. I think it'll be on the screen. Maybe, maybe not. But here's the series. Part one is the hunters, part one. Part two, the hunters, part two. Part three is honor the map. Part four is X marks the spot, obviously with Xmas in that sense. And we'll have Christmas Eve is all a part of that. And then part five is celebrate the good news. And it's just a fun, simple theme. You know the message. You know, even people who don't regularly go to church, you know the message of Christmas. But let's learn something about it. Let's be inspired throughout this month. I'm shocked that it's December 1 today. I don't know where this year went. Stand with me as we do a teaching of command of Jesus. Message title is The Hunters, Part 1. Here's what Jesus says, Matthew 13, 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again, and he sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and he bought it. We're going to talk about treasure hunting over the next five weeks. Pray with me before we sit down. Lord, help us clear our hearts and minds here right now. And just would you meet us right where we're at? Do the thing that you are so good at, and that's whisper into the heart and soul and the ear of each person in this room or anybody listening to this message, and that you would challenge us and convict us in the loving, kind way that you do about areas that we could grow, areas that we need to uh, uh, smooth out, places that you would have us just get better in, and that we would diligently practice throughout this week and the rest of our lives to be the kind of people that you're honored to use, to be the kind of people that represent you in a way that makes you proud. And so thank you for each person here taking it uh, as a priority to be here, committed to grow and sharpen and learn. May you be honored in it all. And Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So if X marks the spot, we're going to begin a treasure hunt looking for the X. And so just follow my train of thought. This is kind of the introductory to the five parts, which means I got the simple one uh, when it comes to part one. Keith will take on one here soon, and we're going back and forth sharing this teaching theme. So follow this. Anything that God creates, which would be everything, and especially that he ordains, is considered a treasure. It's considered a treasure. The kind of treasure that treasure hunters will sacrifice anything to get. If God's the creator of all things, he's the creator of gold and diamonds. He's the creator of treasures and things that are hard to find, uh, treasures that are precious, things that are not common. People who find them, they're considered by everybody else to have been very lucky in life to have found such a treasure. Treasures have value of varying grades. Kingdoms of old 
have fought wars, searched diligently to get treasures, to find that treasure, and then soon lost them to the next kings of old who conquered them to get their treasure that they had found. And countless lives have been lost in wars, wars in pursuit of treasure of all different kinds. Scores of movies, this will be a fun kind of looking back, scores of movies have been created about the theme of being treasure, treasure hunters. I'll say some names here, let it create movie scenes in your brain. Indiana Jones, Romancing the Stone, Goonies, come on, who doesn't love Goonies? Have they done a remake of that yet? We need a remake of Goonies. Jewel of the Nile, National Treasure, The Mummy, Pirates of the Caribbean, Three Kings, The Count of Monte Cristo, Tomb Raider, Finding Nemo, and you remember this one? You got to find that one thing. What movie is that from? City Slickers. Remember City Slickers? Yeah, it's all part of treasure hunting. So here's the deal. The treasure of man, the things that we often treasure, it all comes at a high cost, but it doesn't last. Gold, treasure, hidden treasures, gold coins, shipwrecks, they're all treasures that do not last. But God's treasure has captured his heart And when he lost his treasure, he will stop at nothing to get it back. God is right now searching and hunting for his favorite treasure in all of creation. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they created a masterpiece when it comes to treasure. They call it their prized possession. Genesis 1.26 begins to tell us the hint as to what is his masterpiece. When they said in that passage, let us make mankind in our image, to be like us. And the Apostle Paul backs up what is the treasure of God, the favorite, most prized treasure in all of creation. In Ephesians 2.10, he says, we are all his creation, his masterpiece. The Greek word they use in there is poema. We're his poem. If you sit and write a poem, it takes thought, it takes time, it's something you enjoy to do. There's creativity that goes with it. You and I are considered his poem, and some translators take that poema and they'll translate it masterpiece. We have other scriptures that talk about his prized possession, you and me. And so if you were God's enemy then, knowing that mankind, you, are the treasure of God, And if you're God's enemy as Satan is, and you found out that God has a prized possession, and you wanted to beat on God a little bit, you wanted to seek revenge on the Creator, you wanted to break His heart, what would you do if you were Satan? What strategy would you use? And if you think about it, every great movie... Every great movie theme has a scene where the villain grabs the hero's loved one and tries to use that loved one as a bait to get the hero caught or killed. Hollywood didn't invent that movie scene. That's a story of God from the very beginning taking on the worst villain that exists, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, because that's what Satan does. He's trying to steal God's masterpiece from him. And he, Satan, tricked us all from the very beginning, starting with Adam and Eve, into thinking we're not enough as God's masterpiece. That's not enough. So Satan gets in our ears, your ears, starting with Adam and Eve and through every one of us. He gets in our ear and he says, you won't die if you break God's ways. You'll become more like him. You can be more. You can control your own life. You, you can be just like God. And we take the bait. Have you taken the bait? It's amazing because what Adam and Eve should have done on that spot, although I might not have myself, I'm not pointing fingers here, what they could have done is to say, hold on, Genesis 1.26, God... Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they said, let us make mankind in our image to be like us. What do you mean, Satan, we can be more like God? 
We're created to be like him. Go back to hell, is what they should have said. And so we took the bait and we broke God's ways. And the Bible tells us we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I'm astonished that we as Christians can get so bad and ridiculous and we can point our fingers at anger at other people for sinning and get so mad at them for sinning just in different ways than we do, right? And we do so well to remember when we point, we have three fingers coming back at us. God can't be around sin. That's what happened when we chose to take the bait of the tempter, the villain, and with that, God being holy and perfect, we're banished. He can't be around us. He can't be around sin. And therefore, there's a separation. And we get pushed out of the garden and we flee from God and we go into hiding and we try to stay in the dark and we try to keep secrets. And we become the most prized hidden treasure in all of creation, which sounds exciting, but it's lonely to be lost treasure. Can you imagine being a lost treasure? You know, you think of the, think of the, the movie Aladdin, the remake, just recently, to be stuck in a genie's bottle for 10,000 years, to be hidden, to not be let out, to not be free. Being lost, being lost treasure is extremely lonely. It's not exciting. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit know this. And they're not okay with us being lost. And so they are in process, one at a time, of hunting us down, one by one by one, and drawing us back into a relationship with them. And the Bible backs up this treasure hunter this whole idea that God's the great treasure hunter. I'd like to read some segments. Let's sit back and listen. Simple message today. Be reminded today of how loved you are, how much of a treasure you are to the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars. Here's some teachings of Jesus. We won't stand for this part. It says, if a man has a hundred sheep, Jesus tells a story, and one gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search the one that is lost till he finds it? And when he has found it, he'll joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he'll call together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. How about another example? Or suppose, Jesus says, a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp, sweep the entire house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and her neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. And in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Maybe you've heard this story. I'll read it quickly. It's a little bit longer. A man has two sons. The younger told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land and became a lost treasure to the dad. There he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. He began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him. Uh, the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I love that scene. I envision him standing at the sink. Maybe his wife needed him to do the dishes. And he's looking out the window, and he sees a silhouette coming over the hill, and he recognizes that shape. And he goes running. What does God, as he's been hunting for you, what does he do when he sees your silhouette, when he sees you take a baby step just a little bit closer to him? The story goes on. He returned home to his father, still far off. His father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. 
great explanation of God, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, kissed him. His son to him said, Dad, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. His father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house. Put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the fattened calf. We have been uh, preparing this calf as a celebration with the feast. For this son of mine was dead, and now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. There's more to the story you can read in Luke 15. But three great examples of Jesus, the creator of all things, talking about how he loves being a treasure hunter. And you are his finest treasure. The treasure of God is you and me. And God is on the hunt. It's on the screen. There should be a screen that simply says, I am a treasure of God. And I believe on occasion, I'm not one of those uh, prosperity preachers that if you claim it, name it, claim it, whatever thing. But I think sometimes you and I need to tell ourselves, for I don't know about you, but I wrestle with insecurities often. I wrestle often wondering if I'm good enough in certain scenarios and things. And there's something valuable about you physically, verbally saying out loud on the count of three, one, two, three, I am a treasure of God. Typically, a weird preacher will have you look at each other and say, tell, tell the person next to you that you're a treasure of God. It just seems weird to me. I'm not going to make you do that. <laughs> you know, you're welcome to if you want. Many find it difficult. Many find it difficult that you are wanted by the Lord, that you're wanted by the Savior. To be seen as good. When God created you, he declared it on all things good. Religion has created an incredible dilemma upon mankind. I'll say it because I mean it. Satan is the founder of religion. Jesus hates religion. It is not created by God. Religion is a man-made tradition that, that just lacks relationship. And it's tragic. Religious duty, religious faith has made God appear mean-spirited and impersonal. And like we're a bunch of robots that are supposed to go through duty. Not a single one of us want a relationship, if you have kids, with your kid that's based off of repetition and rote and quote and memorization. It's supposed to be personal improv. What's going on in our hearts, sharing openly with each other. And it's tragic what has happened to what God intended to be simply Christianity. We've turned it into religion. And it just cannot, we can't keep going that direction anymore. And the reality is, is that God is loving. He is kind. He is patient. He reveals himself in, himself in so many ways to you. Think about it. Answered prayer. Could be little or big things. Some signs and wonders still exist to this day. If you'll look, you'll see miracles all around you happening. Salvation. People are completely hopeless, hopeless and, and stuck in the, in the ditches of life, the gutters of life, completely turning their life around, becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus, using their platform of tragedy and terror and victimization to actually share about the love and the hope of Almighty God. Those are miraculous things, countless ways in your and my personal life where God shows up and reveals himself to us. Are you looking? Next week's title is, You're the Hunter. God's the Hunter for part one. Part two, we're the hunters hunting to continue seek God and have him in our lives, to see him at work each and every day around us. God is an incredibly loving hunter. So if you think about it, I love the imagery that's created when I write this down. It's on the screen. God is on the hunt for you like an almighty archaeologist. He's the almighty archaeologist. He's digging through all your dirt to get to his masterpiece, you. And he wants you to show up to him dirty. He just wants you to go, I admit, and I'm so sorry. And he will wash you white as snow, it says. He's that good. 
And it says, and we read three individual stories about it, that when you show up in all your dirt, I, it, we're living it more and more where I meet more and more people who literally believe. It, it used to be this in church. People didn't want to come here, and there's still a little of this because they say churches are full of hypocrites. But I'm convinced that's a, defen a defense mechanism. It's a wall that people put up. Because what I'm finding now in conversations with people who don't go to church, they don't feel like they're good enough. And they encounter you or us, and they think we have our lives together. Boy, we got them fooled. You know? And people are afraid to come to church because they don't think they can measure up to what you have in your life. And what our culture needs is for us to walk out these doors and go meet people with your junk, tell your stories, tell your life change things, admit that you don't have it all together. And you might find that people's hearts out there will be a little more open to coming in here and being a part of, of what is church. So think with me. Let's see if I'm back on track here. When God finally ex excavates you from this filthy world, from your own filthy and my own filthy decisions, lost faith, whatever it is, he then invites you as a treasure refound back into his ownership to a lifetime of discovery and renewal and adventure for him. Minute by minute asking, what shall I do with this person that you have brought across my path, Lord? Thank you for finding me. How may I be used to help them be found by you as well? You were once lost treasure, but now you are found. I was lost, but now I'm found. That story, you don't have to have Bible verses memorized. Those are always helpful in your own personal life. I have yet to meet anybody when I'm talking to them about God saying, please quote to me all the Bible verses you have memorized, O wise one. Nobody's ever said that. But you know what? Like sitting on the edge of their seat, and often I don't think my story is that exciting. And I meet, I'm telling you, it's a higher percentage than not of Christians who think my story's not that great. But every time I hear your story, I'm on the edge of my seat. Every time somebody's listening to my story, they're on the edge of their seat. Your story of what it happened between being lost to being found is miraculous. And it's all the Bible you need. It's all the Bible education you need to help people also be found. Stop being discouraged if you are that you don't think you know enough about the Bible. Keep learning. Keep growing. It's a lifelong process. And I'm discovering every time I read through the Bible, which is almost every year, I read something that I've never seen there before. God's almost miraculous that way. And it's so powerful. I'm like, there's no way that was there last year, God. There's no way. And your story of I once was lost, but now I'm found is the greatest life-changing factor in a person you're trying to impact. Share your story. Drop the pride. Share the details. Let them know you were lost and now you're found. You've been found because God went on the hunt, and here's the proof. Listen to these passages, and we'll be done. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word, is it up there? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transliterate this like it could be read. In the beginning, Jesus already existed. The Word was with Jesus, and, G or, sorry, in the beginning, Jesus already existed. Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Jesus. Nothing was created except through Jesus. Jesus gave life to everything that was created, and Jesus' life brought light to everyone. Here's a critical factor. The hunt was on. So Jesus became human, and he made his home amongst us. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the story of Christmas. The treasure hunt. Listen to this passage of treasure hunting. For this is how God loved the world and everybody in it. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save it, to find it, to bring it back, the lost treasure through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus. 
But anyone who does not believe in Jesus has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right, they come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. You come to the light to honor the Lord, but you come to the light and you live in the light so that others will notice. What happened with you? How did you get found? How can I be like that? How can I be found? How about John 3, 35 and 36? The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life, means they've become a found treasure. And anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment or remains a lost treasure. Obedience matters. So here's some questions of reflection. What is it that I want, you want, to have recognized? These are ponder questions. Pause for a moment. We'll be done in a couple minutes. I'm about to miraculously preach a 30-minute message. Crazy. (laughs) What is it that I want to have recognized? What do you want recognized in your life? To be recognized for so that I can feel more accepted. Why is that important to me? It's really a good follow-up message to my son's message about where is our identity from last week. Why is it important to me? Why why do I need to be recognized? What is it that I feel I need to have happen in my life so that I can be more accepted? Why is that important to me? Just a reiteration. How would I like to be recognized? There's so much power in that question. So much revealing of what's going on inside of us. There's three more quick questions here. How then can I make myself more recognizable by God? It's kind of a trick question. I guess the only way that we can be more recognizable to God is if He's treasure hunting us. He doesn't force you. He could demand right now that you, a hidden treasure, just surface and come to Him. It'd be like Him putting you in a headlock and saying, you will love me. He's not a control freak. He sadly... Sometimes life would be easy if he'd just do that, wouldn't he? Force us all to love him, not have a single person go to hell. But I don't know about you. If you got kids, just try to force them to love you. Just try it. How's that going to work for God? We turned our backs on him when he wasn't trying to force us. He was all good for us. And so the question is, how can I make myself more recognizable by God? Let yourself be found Drop all the pride if if that's what it, whatever it is that's holding you back. I'm just using that one as an example. Become more transparent. Become more vulnerable. Just fully understand he sees you. He knows you. He made you. You're not hidden to him. You're not a stranger to him. But he's just saying, come here. Come climb up in my lap and I will show you the whole life. The complete life. How can I make myself more recognizable to God? My gosh, just submit to Him. What will this do for me if I am more recognized and therefore found? My last question. What kind of relationship will I be making through this recognition and therefore no longer being lost? Man, the Christian life, if it's lived how... how It's meant to be lived, not muddied by religion. The freedom, oh, it's so freeing to live as a found creation, a found masterpiece of Almighty God. Last note, a cautionary note. When it comes to building a relationship with Jesus, and every single one of us, it doesn't matter how mature you may think you are or I may think I am, We are maturing still for the rest of our lives until Jesus remains. We're never complete until Jesus returns. Uh, 
this relationship with Jesus, it needs to be what we would call a mutual relationship. You've heard me talk a lot over the last couple of years because I think our culture needs it. Jesus is so kind, so loving, so graceful. God the Father, so patient, so kind, so loving. Careful. It's true, but careful. That tends to be a one-sided relationship instead of a mutual relationship. Maybe kind of like a, a husband and wife and there's an abusive situation and one party keeps getting abused, but the abused one just continues to be so loving and kind and patient and the abuse just continues to happen. It's one way. It's a sick. It's not a good relationship. It's, it's terrible. If one side over-accommodates that doesn't lead to the recognition desired by both and actually has an opposite effect in being a found treasure. So the two magic words that we need to, to really land on is the word Lord and Savior. So often in our culture today, Jesus is being portrayed and there's definitely a need because religion has made God to be so mean. But a true God outside of religion in his true form, he is so loving and kind. He definitely is the Savior. He's the one who's on the hunt drawing us back, and he created the bridge so that we could travel back. We've done nothing to return other than to say, thank you for finding me. I submit to you. He's done all the work, but don't let Jesus be just your Savior where he threw out the life raft and draw you in and you just float and he pulls you around all the time and you never do anything about it. There's no lordship there. That's just us being lazy Christians saying, thank you for covering my sin. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for finding me. What he's asking of us is to take a knee before him and say, I don't just acknowledge you as savior in my life, but I acknowledge you as Lord, the kind that says, Yes, sir, anything you ask. We've done a message called bond servant, bond slavery, where we're set free, but we choose to reject our freedom to self, and we submit all of our life to the Lord and say, I'm yours for eternity. Anything you ask, I'm in. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to walk away from. I will do anything you ask. I will hold nothing back, for you are my Lord as well as my Savior. There needs to be a balance so that both sides give and receive, recognize and value what the other person has accomplished. God's grateful for the work that you do. Go out and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, take care of the orphan and the widow, feed uh, uh, to visit the prisoner and all the other things that are good. That's a good thing that we do. God is grateful for that. Keep it up. That's acknowledging he's Lord. And he's also grateful to be your savior, where you simply were lost, but now you are found. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. Help us keep sorting this out. Help us keep thinking about what's going on inside of us, about what kind of recognition we need in this world, what kind of things that we're looking and on the hunt for. And help us just stop. Take a deep breath and just be so grateful to have been found. Thank you that you are the great, hunter, the almighty archaeologist. You're willing to knock off and sort through all of our mud and dirt and foulness and reveal the true jewel that each and every one of us are to you. Thank you for, for, for loving us so very much. May we just soak in that. And then may we end it for the rest of our lives by taking a knee and saying, I'm all in. Whatever you ask, Lord, help me represent you well. Help me obey you. And I pray that for each and every one of us as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a great week, everybody.